I am very, very pleased to have with us Chip Hazard, who is on the board of our Stigida Corporation. Uh, Chip studied at uh, Stanford and Harvard, mm -hmm. from Harvard, and uh, he's been involved with financing e-businesses for the last uh, eight or nine years or so. Seems like longer, but yeah, <laughs> seven and a half. And we've had a lot of technical talks at our colloquium up till now on a variety of different subjects, but I think it's really appropriate for everybody, especially a group here of mature people coming back from other directions of life and then coming back into computer science to look at things through not just the academic point of view, but also through how the world really works. And Chip is going to talk to us today about financing e-businesses. So please welcome Chip Hasbro. Uh, thanks. I appreciate everyone taking the time. This will be, uh, from what I understand, just a little bit different from uh, the, the, the previous work you've been doing. But I would characterize this as once you get through AD University and you have the uh, technology and computer science bug and you want to go out and start your own business, raise money for it, and go on to do great things, uh, this is the, well, how do I actually get that started and how do I think about raising money and uh, you know, what do people like myself who actually finance companies think about uh, when we're assessing uh, new businesses? So that's what I'll walk through. The world is, is obviously different, um, but I gave a talk like this uh, at a Cisco seminar uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, I started out with, well, this is the process. It's really pretty simple. You, you first step, you go to Menlo Park, you find the tree that's in the, the you know, the, the main courtyard there. You shake that tree, a VC will fall out of that tree. You shout Java, ASP, B2B, open source, whatever you want. You get $10 million in financing. You build your company, you go public, you sell out. You go to Waltham and the park, find a tree and climb it. So that's the way the world used to be. Uh, what I'll quickly go through, just so you know who you're, who you're talking to, is a little bit of the background of Greylock, which is where I work. Uh, talk about the, the startup climate today, how one thinks about managing the process of, uh, of raising capital, what people look for, what we don't look for, and then this is all you know, five or six slides, and then most importantly, uh, open it up to questions and answers. Uh, in terms of what, what Greylock is, we're uh, uh, one of the premier early stage uh, venture firms. Uh, we're, we're headquartered both here in Boston and in Silicon Valley. We've been doing this uh, as an institution for 36 years, which means we've been at it for a long time in the venture business. Uh, we've invested in some 300 companies. Uh, there's probably now 150 of those that have gone public. Uh, another 80 or 90 have merged with other entities. Uh, and the rest are, are private companies uh, that we're currently working with, like Ars Digita. Uh, in terms of our organization, we're, we're 11 uh, general partners, uh, also equally split between the East and West Coast. Uh, we just raised a new uh, fund, which is around a billion dollars, uh, which was our 11th uh, fund. Previous ones had been uh, uh, 500 and 250, at least the most previous two. Investors, just so you get a flavor for how the venture business works, we raise a pool of capital from a group of limited partners. In our situation, those limited partners are uh, a group of about 10 families, uh, the endowments of six universities, uh, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, uh, Duke, Dartmouth, and MIT, uh, and then a group of entrepreneurs that we've been in business with that want to stay involved with the sort of entrepreneurial process. And what we try to tell people is, is the money is really only a very small aspect of what we try to bring to the table. We're, we really try to partner with entrepreneurs to help them build businesses, and that's help in recruiting and strategy and uh, facilitating relationships, getting into the right customers, all those kind of things. Uh, in terms of our focus, uh, we focus in two broad uh, fields in the technology world, uh, enterprise software, sort of broadly defined, uh, which is software, services, infrastructure companies like storage and security, uh, communications companies, uh, those people that are building the boxes uh, or the components of those boxes or, or the service providers. Uh, these are just a flavor for some of the companies we've been involved with, uh, both uh, publicly and, and privately. In terms of what, what, what's been different uh, over the last couple of years, the uh, I know you all came from sort of different walks of life, but the, the startup climate, if you've read the press or 
paid any attention has been a little crazy over the last couple of years. There's uh, entrepreneurs have been coming out of the woodwork. Woodwork. There's more sort of startups than ever before. Uh, you know, we, I personally probably get somewhere on the order of 50 to 100 business plans a week uh, from people saying that they want to do this or that. And uh, if you can imagine multiplying that by 10, and that's only one uh, firm's view of the world. So there's just a huge entrepreneurial uh, frenzy that, that was occurring over the last few years. Uh, and it was in part obviously driven by the advent of the Internet in the sense that it was going to change the world and there was therefore sort of unbounded opportunities. It was also driven by the fact that there was more money uh, than ever before uh, out there trying to pursue these opportunities. And so uh, there was a tremendous degree of access to capital. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs thought money was free uh, and therefore uh, spent it uh, like it was free. Um, uh, and, and, you know, th that was sort of the, the sense uh, that we had from our side of the table. The, the nice thing is that customers, whether they be large Fortune 500 companies or uh, telecommunications companies, that more so than ever before, uh, they were willing to work with early stage companies. And so uh, previously, you sort of had to work your way up to sell into Ford Motor Company. Uh, in, in the new world uh, where, where everything was changing, suddenly, you know, one of my companies, which was 15 people, sells a multi-million dollar deal to, uh, in this case, Ford Motor Company, and, and, and that was a real change. What people didn't have uh, is there just wasn't time. Uh, there was a sense that I really had to rush to get to market. First mover advantage, I got to move really quickly. Uh, it was incredibly hard to build organizations. Uh, because you just couldn't find talented people. There was only so many computer scientists graduating from college each year, uh, and it put a real premium on being able to access uh, talent. And it got a lot harder to differentiate yourself. It, you know, for every good idea that we saw, there was 10 other smart entrepreneurs pitching pretty much the same idea. And so you ended up with uh, 10 companies trying to, you know, sell pet food over the Internet. In terms of, of today, I mean, I think the change in the in the uh, financial markets are pretty well documented again in the public press you know it, it is it is definitely a different world for my partners who've been in this business for uh, a long time and even for when I joined in in uh, in 94 uh, this is a little bit more of the back to the basics uh, the the capital markets are much more selective people are focusing on you know, what's the real business you're trying to build, not just, well, that sounds like a cool idea or that's different. Uh, and can you build that business with, uh, without burning uh, $100 million of capital or, or, or spending an inordinate amount of money? And unfortunately, the, the customers who were driving a lot of the uptake of new software companies or new communications companies, uh, they, were, they were moving quickly because they felt, they felt a real fear from being "Quote unquote Amazon, or, or have their business be put out of business by these young upstart companies, uh, and so that level of urgency that customers have felt uh, historically has, has definitely changed. You know, that said, there's still huge opportunities. Uh, you know, again, we're we're not seeing any change necessarily in the flow of ideas. Uh, and now talking to uh, customers, which I try to do on a on a pretty regular basis, there's, they're still spending, they're still looking for new opportunities, they're still looking to deploy technology in a way that's really going to drive significant value and differentiate themselves. And ultimately, it, you know, now is actually a great time to start a business because it may actually be easier uh, to build a company that can last. Uh, you can actually find office space, you can recruit people, you can uh, hire lawyers, all of which you couldn't really do over the last couple of years. Uh, you, you may be targeting if you've got a nice niche or an area you're going after. It's more likely than, than previously that you may be the only person going after that niche, which, which represents a great opportunity. And because you have a little bit more time, you can really focus on the underlying technology. You can actually build something that has significant uh, barriers and is, is really differentiated from a technology perspective. So that, that's a quick, uh, very high-level view of, of what the climate is for, for startups today. Uh, you know, oftentimes we get people who ask us, you know, gee, I, need, I got this idea. I want to go out and raise, raise money. How do I go about doing that? Uh, and part of it is trying to determine what exactly you want to do. Uh, do you want to build a huge business that you're going to try to take public or sell to Cisco or do something like that? Do you want to build a small uh, uh, business that you know you you'll have 10 or 20 people and you'll you'll 
have a lot of fun, but but keep it sort of a manageable size where you can uh, uh, not necessarily have lots of constituencies you have to keep happy. And so it's important to sort of really do your homework, be very introspective uh, in terms of what your personal motivations are, what do you want to achieve. Once you do that, it's then trying to think through what's the best partner for me. If I if I don't need a lot of money and I uh, and or it's a very uh, sort of raw idea I'm cooking around, well, maybe I should go out and talk to quote unquote angels who are individual investors, previously been successful uh, and are spending their time investing uh, both time and money in, in very early stage uh, companies. Uh, perhaps you think that you need to raise a little bit more capital. You want a lot of the advice that a professional uh, venture capitalist can bring to the table. Uh, so maybe they can uh, be an appropriate path to go down. Or perhaps uh, you could you could bootstrap the business and you could get it funded by customers, uh, either directly as paying customers or uh, as corporate partners who would help uh, invest in the company. And, and you know throughout this whole process, if you ever go out and talk to financial folks, it's extremely hard to figure out what they say. If someone says that's very interesting, gee, I'll get back to you. Uh, nine times out of ten, maybe they're saying, well, I really didn't think much of that and. Uh, uh, why don't you go somewhere else? And so it's it's hard to sometimes discern uh, what people really mean, and you, so you need to spend some time sort of trying to read the tea leaves. In terms of what what Greylock looks for, we're we're clearly in the uh, in the venture capital camp. Our prototypical investment is um, sort of four people, an idea, and a prototype. Uh, and so it's it's a very early stage. Company and so so what we're looking for is is a core team. We want to uh, sit down with those four people and really uh, feel the energy and the passion and the excitement that they have for uh, the idea they're going after. We don't we don't need to feel like they've got everybody they'll ever need uh, in the company, nor even everybody senior in the team that they need, because uh, that's a lot of what we try to help companies do. Uh, what we also like to look for is what I call Pied Pipers. These are people who through their sort of infectious energy and enthusiasm can uh, rally people behind their vision. You know, the idea of starting a, a company to uh, go out and build something is, is you know, at times certainly a, a pretty audacious task. You know, every potential investment, well, Microsoft's a competitor, or Oracle's a competitor, or Sun's a competitor. How can I, you know, three people in an idea ever dream of taking on those big companies? And And you do it because... You have you have just a fundamental belief in in the idea and your fundamental sort of talents, and you have an ability to actually convince other people to get behind that parade, which is uh, which is not an easy thing to do. But but when we see those kind of people, that's that's also what gets us pretty excited. Uh, we're we're pretty heavy uh, technology investors, so we're looking for people who are really deploying uh, pretty deep technology that creates real value for customers. There's there's a lot of examples of people deploying deep technology, they may not necessarily be doing so in a way that uh, creates value. And so it's it's a uh, it's sort of a boring approach to the business. But if you were to go pitch XYZ company, would they decide to buy from you because they think that either the money they would save and or the, the revenues they would generate from that uh, technology solution would be significantly uh, larger than the cost of deploying it? Uh, ultimately, we're trying to play in, in, in large markets, things that are driven by real customers, uh, yet people who are sort of somewhat focused. Because, uh, again, I think the thing that kills uh, most startups is trying to uh, do everything. And it's hard when, again, you, you, you know, if you accomplish your first couple of goals, you, you put together a group of people who are incredibly creative, incredibly driven, uh, and therefore has sometimes have an ability to go in 15 different directions, which, which if you're five or ten people, while well, you go in 15 different directions, you know, you're not, you're spread way too thin, uh, and you're not ultimately going to be successful. What we, what we don't, uh, like are, are pretty, pretty basic things, but it's, uh, uh, someone will go and they'll be talking to us and they'll present their plan and well, this happens and this happens and this happens and then, you know, well, it all sort of works out. Uh, that, 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 that doesn't tend to make us very happy, whether that be, uh, you know, a key invention that's required that they're not really sure how they're going to go about doing that, um, uh, but they expect it'll happen. Or, uh, you know, 15 different pieces of a puzzle need to fall in place before the company can ultimately be successful. 
from a people perspective, uh, we'll, we'll see a lot of businesses where, you know, it's quote unquote, uh, round pegs and square holes. It, it's, it may be a great person, but they're, they're just not well suited for the task. It's a, uh, person who's a ASIC designer from the communications industry trying to build a software system that, you know, that doesn't necessarily fit. Uh, back to the, to the focus point. Uh, again, there's always a temptation to, uh, try to do too much to quote unquote boil the ocean and, and, you know, some of our most successful companies have been those that have started highly focused in a, in a relatively small niche and then use that as a beachhead from which they can expand to uh, take on other things. Uh, the, the, the fourth point is one just from a personal perspective to the extent I get 87 page business plans, needless to say, they don't necessarily get read, uh, especially if you're getting, uh, 50 in a, in a given week. So trying to be able to very concisely uh, communicate your message, which is important not really just for financial folks, but but as much so for your ultimate customers, for the people you're going to try to recruit to join your team. You need to be able to hit, you know, with a 30-second quote-unquote elevator pitch, you know, what is it that I'm doing that's really different and, and why uh, is that something that's exciting that, that you want to be part of? Um, and then lastly, and this is this was especially true over the last uh, a uh, few years where, where there was just so much of the things that we saw in terms of businesses being started, they were, they were me too's. It was the 15th person doing, uh, doing a pet store on the internet, which is a, an easy one to pick on, um, because it was the most sort of egregious example, but, but lots of good ideas, but a good idea in a relatively small market, if there's 20 other people trying to do exactly the same thing, well, well, suddenly it's less good of an idea. So that's, uh, I told you I would be short. Uh, it, uh, it, you know, to me, this is much more uh, of an interactive uh, dialogue because I didn't know which way people wanted to go in terms of uh, uh, thinking about this, but I wanted to at least share uh, a quick overview of in terms of, of how we see the market, the kind of things we do, and how we think about uh, financing startups. I'll give you both an example of a guy I'm, I'm involved with and then a, an example of someone who's, who's you know, had a significant track record. Um, one example is I invested in a company in February of 99. It was a guy who was 22 years old, had just gotten out of Harvard University. And, you know, so he had no track record, uh, no real experience. I think he had worked a summer at Microsoft. Uh, but somehow he managed to convince eight of his classmates that rather than taking a, a high paying job at some, uh, you know, company that recruited at, at Harvard that year, uh, they should join him and live in his, uh, you know, fourth story apartment in Central Square and actually write software for, uh, for six months. And then, uh, he managed to convince Lycos and another company that they should really buy this software from this company that was run out of a, apartment building and, and, you know, no one could drive because none of them had driver's license. Uh, you know, how do you do that? Uh, you do that by, you know, A, having a good idea, uh, but B, by just being incredibly persistent and really being able to sell why uh, what they're doing is different and a good idea and, you know, something that's going to be fun and, and, and exciting. Um, so that's the, that's the, uh, that's probably the easiest example. I think then, you know, as one moves later in life, you know, there's a guy here locally called Desh Despande who's a very successful uh, communications uh, startup guy. And, you know, he's now on his, I think, fourth startup. So needless to say, when he shows up and says, I'm going to do another one, well, there's a, there's a lot of people who are, who are going on track record. So one can be a, a, a Pied Piper in very different ways, but the more interesting ones are obviously to me the, the people who are just doing it purely on the on the power of the idea and the and the sort of the power of their excitement. How do you treat people who only have the power of their excitement and the power of their idea and have no track record at all? I mean, what would make you want to? I mean, in that situation, you're really looking at a lot of risk. Right. Would a, would a venture capital firm consider that? I mean, yeah. Obviously, in some cases, that happens. Right. So, so in that particular case, we did, um, the, the example I was giving. Uh, and I think it was for, for a couple of reasons. One is they had, they clearly demonstrated on no resources and ability to get a lot of things done. And, uh, so anytime you see tremendous accomplishments with, with relatively, uh, limited resources, that sort of makes you, makes you stand up and notice. Uh, secondly, you know, we just happened to like, the particular market opportunity they were going after. It was, it was something that no one else was doing, we thought was very early, but potentially very exciting. 
And then I think the most important thing uh, was this person uh, sort of knew what he didn't know. Um, and, you know, I've met with a lot of folks with no track record or no uh, background. They say, but, you know, uh, I'm going to be the CEO of this company for the rest of the life. You know, work for Steve Jobs, well, it should work for me. Um, and And I think... You know, while there are examples that that prove that out, uh, they're relatively few and far between. And so, the most important thing in this particular situation was he he came to me and said, "Hey, Chip, I need uh, all the help you can give me, uh, especially in building out a management team." And so, we found the CEO for the company, someone to run an engineering organization, someone to run marketing, someone to run sales, someone to run their services group, uh, and and he's still the chairman and the founder and and a highly sort of important part of the of the team but he recognized that he needed to surround himself with uh, a lot of resources that that had sort of been there and done that and and uh, and could help drive the drive the original vision forward no, I think it's a good question the, you know I think it depends to a certain extent of what the ideals are um, you know and that's the point I was making about understanding you know what you're getting with a particular uh, investor, if your ideal is you never want the company to be more than 20 people and, and you're not particularly concerned if it makes a whole lot of money, uh, well, then you probably shouldn't be talking to venture capitalists because ultimately they're focused on trying to build a, a big business that could go public or, or, or be sold. Um, and so, you know, it is important to understand what you want relative to control from a uh, sort of ownership perspective. Uh, we never have control uh, as an individual Firm, I think the you know we own anywhere between 10 and 35 percent of a company, uh, depending on how much uh, money's gone in. So we're not oriented towards control. We don't have control over a board of directors, for example. Um, and what we're 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 focused on is making sure sort of there's an aligned set of incentives, and in that uh, what the entrepreneurs want is similar to what we want, and that we want to all build collectively together a great company. Uh, that does great things, um, and it's just important to sort of sort those out in the course of, of trying to understand each other. And you know, one of my partners says in, investing in a company is, you know, it's worse than getting married because you can't get divorced. Uh, you can't divorce your investor. You're you're committed for, uh, you know, five, seven, ten, you know, who knows how long uh, number of years. When we invest, we're making a five to seven year commitment. I think. Uh, over the past few years, there was a sense, well, maybe that was all being compressed, and you could, uh, you know, build a company, you know, go from from startup to going public to, you know, my first slide selling out in the span of 18 months. I mean, and, and there were certainly some examples that supported that, uh, but it's really not realistic if you think about, you know, how do you build a real company over a long period of time? And so our our commitment is we're there essentially as long as it takes to turn it into a company where our value uh, is, is sort of significantly reduced. Um, and so I've, I've been on uh, some boards uh, right now six or seven years, um, and we'll stay on them as long as it sort of makes sense. And, and others, they happen to sort of go through a cycle relatively quickly. We're probably somewhat of an outlier. Um, we, we probably stay longer uh, than a lot of people. Um, it's one of the things we try to pitch entrepreneurs is that we're not, you know, we don't come in, give you money, and disappear. Um, uh, but I, I, it's not something I've studied uh, at any great level of detail. When when you when you first get started, and so I'll just, just take the example I keep using, which is, you know, four guys and a prototype that maybe they're four guys or gals and a prototype and maybe an idea they've run by uh, two or three customers, but they haven't sold any customers. I think that. The challenges in the in the first stages uh, are are all all revolve around sort of three things. Uh, one is building the rest of the team uh, to sort of go out and attack this idea, and that's you know building an engineering organization of some size, uh, building a marketing organization that's trying to hone the message and, and what it is that you're uh, you're delivering, um, building a small sales organization to go out and uh, you know, it attacked the first few customers. Um, so the first side of things in the early days is, is organizational. Can you put together a team? Can that team work together? Does the team get along, have fun? All those kind of things. The second is actually building what you've, what you've said you were going to build. And, you know, that's the uh, whole product development process. Uh, and, and, you know, as all you know from what you're learning about software development, 
software development is not necessarily about can I build it, but it's can I build it over what period of time, and the key to bringing a good software product to market is actually determining what you're not going to put in it, um, because it's very easy to go out and talk to 10 customers and come back with a list of, well, gee, there's 100 things that would be great if this if this could do, uh, but you know, it'll take me five years to build those 100 things, so maybe I should focus on what are the 10 key things, get that out and release one, get it into people's hands, and then incrementally improve that. Um, uh, so, you know, I'd characterize the first year or two of a company's life uh, as being putting together the team, uh, building the product that, at least the initial product that, that meets what you think the market needs, and then trying to go out and find, uh, you know, five to ten uh, customers who actually will stand up and say, you know, I want to buy this, I like it, uh, they implement it, they use it, uh, it delivers on what it promises to, uh, to deliver on. Uh, and then, you know, I see this in our companies. They go from sort of that creative, formative stage to the the more quote unquote execution oriented stage, where you need to go from, you know, five customers to 500 customers or whatever the right number is, uh, and you need to build a real sales and marketing organization to drive the message out into the marketplace, have people selling the product, whether it's in person or over the phone or over the internet or whatever, uh, and and that becomes sort of the, the next couple of years of a company's life is proving that we can take this idea that we sold to a few people and we can actually scale it and we can turn this into a real uh, business that can uh, that can grow very quickly and, and uh, make a lot of people happy. Uh, and then, you know, I think after that it moves into uh, two, two directions. One is uh, proving that that whole thing can make money and be a profitable uh, enterprise and ultimately if you want to be a public company or sell or, or whatnot, you know, you, you need to convince people that it can, it can make money. And then, you know, continuing to look for ways to expand the scope of what you're doing. And, you know, a lot, as I said earlier, a lot of our companies, they're targeting a niche at first and they, they're, they ramp very quickly. They're exploiting that niche and then their challenge is great. You know, I've sold 80% of the potential people I can sell. Uh, this too. What, what is what is Act Two? What's Act Three? How do I move uh, from there? And and that continues the the life cycle. We feel like we're focused. You know, 30 years ago we used to do healthcare and biotech and technology and uh, you know various different things. So we've gradually honed our focus um, within communications or within software. Uh, there are certainly areas we like more than others. Things that we've done better at or worse at. Uh, but we've also found that we get we get into trouble when feeling like uh, you know we really need to have a content management software company because if you say well I got to have one of those you know someone walks through their door and they say well I'm a content management software company you say great I, you know this is exactly what I'm looking for you know check that box off um, and, and and so while we have ideas and themes we at the end of the day react much more to the individual people the individual story. Um, but, you know, if you look at our portfolio, you see a lot of application software, you'll see a lot of security companies, you'll see a lot of storage companies, um, uh, you'll see collaboration, uh, you know, we're, we're believers in, in sort of digital media long term and how that's going to change that whole industry. Um, so there's really some, some ideas. It's probably not atypical, but, but certainly, um, there's people who are highly focused, even more so than we are, and then there's people who are much more broad uh, than we are. So I think, you know, I think unfortunately, the venture industry, which which used to be quite small, is now fairly significant in size, and therefore you can find one of anything if you want. We were we were introduced to the company uh, through through two paths. One is Ern Blackwelder, who I don't know if you've met, uh, who's one of the executives. There. I actually worked with Ern uh, ten years ago, so we knew each other personally. Uh, and then the other was a guy, uh, one of my other partners know, who had started a company that was sold to Interwoven, uh, met and knew Philip. Uh, and so literally on the same day, Ern called me and this other guy called my partner, Bill Kaiser. And that was probably in February of last year, I would guess, maybe January of last year. Uh, at the time, you know, the company was 65 or so people, uh, had grown like a weed, uh, and uh, it was it was of those 65, uh, you know, 63 were engineers and technologists. Um, 
And so we uh, we invested in the company along with another firm called General Atlantic. Uh, I think together we put in uh, $35 million uh, to help uh, build a management team, uh, sort of productize the, the ACS and the toolkit, and continue to sort of expand and, and grow the business. Uh, and that's what we're doing. Um, so our current involvement is we're, we're minority investors. We're on the board of directors. Um, and we spend uh, we spend a lot of time trying to help them put together the organization, think through the strategy, uh, and and sort of continue to advance uh, uh, the direction of the company. I mean, I think we were we were someone they wanted to talk to because we've we've probably made more open source investments than any other venture firm. Uh, we were the lead investors in Red Hat, uh, lead investors in a company called Cygnus Solutions out on the West Coast, which was actually sold to Red Hat. Uh, in a company called eSmith, uh, which is up in Canada. And so we're, we, we didn't need any convincing about open source. We think it's, it's the way a significant portion of the software development world is going. Um, there's significant advantages from a development perspective and from a sales and marketing perspective uh, that it's hard for licensed, traditional licensed software companies to compete with. Um, and so for, for those reasons, we, we were highly... Uh, attracted to uh, what they were doing from an open source perspective. Uh, that said, the only, I think the only way it, it challenges, uh, it doesn't challenge the communication or how we interact with the company. It does sort of focus, you know, the issues that you need to work on. Uh, you know, a licensed software model is very well understood. There's been, uh, you know, hundreds if not thousands of companies that have pursued the old license model and, and how you build that and develop it and ship it and sell it is, is, Sort of well understood and well documented. Open source, to a certain extent, you're you're uh, figuring it out as you go, um, and so it, it needs to. It's a more creative uh, process because you don't have a, a well articulated roadmap to follow. From a development perspective, if you look at uh, some of the successful open source products out there, whether it be whether it be Linux or Apache or SendMail, the products have actually tended to be better products. I mean, a lot of people say, gee, why does Linux sell uh, in the enterprise? Is it because it's free or cheap? Uh, and if you talk to most customers, they'll tell you, well, no, it's actually not because it's free or cheap. It's because it's incredibly stable and it works. Um, and so, y you know, the rapid development cycles, the extremely broad community of people who are using, interacting, potentially improving, QAing uh, the software, you can uh, iterate through uh, development cycles uh, relatively more quickly and potentially end up with something that uh, is a lot more stable and, and uh, potentially more bug free than you know a, a, a closed source company that only has 30 or 40 engineers. Um, so that's that's sort of one aspect of that. I would say from an Ars Digital perspective, they're sort of at the front end of that process. Obviously, most of the software that's in or most of the technology that's part of ACS has been developed by Ars Digital. There's not it's, it's, you know, it's not like Linux. There's not a thousand developers who are contributing to the kernel. Um, although even in the case of Linux, if you actually look through who really contributes what, it's a relatively small group of people who are doing most of the uh, of the heavy lifting. Um, and then the second thing that's interesting uh, is from a sales and marketing perspective, it, it, it's a way to sort of extend the reach of a company uh, in, a, in a completely different way. And so you know, at, at Ars Digital, they, you know, something like 3,000 people have downloaded the software uh, this month, and that's 3,000 people who we have no idea who they are. Uh, I mean, we know who they are, but we didn't touch them, we didn't sell them, we didn't uh, have to do much to get them to take the software, start using it, start building things, and the hope is obviously that uh, as they as they do that, they will then come to Ars Digital Corporation because, you know, that's going to help them gain access to the expertise, to the services, to the uh, support, maintenance, hosting, uh, future uh, releases of the product, whatnot. Uh, and so you can you can extend the reach of the company in a pretty uh, interesting way and in a, in a potentially low-cost way. And, and to me, this all was characterized. I got an email from a guy who was, uh, I think the, the headline was, I'm an Ars Digital Groupie. Uh, and, you know, he, he was in Hong Kong, I think, had no idea how he found me. Uh, but he had implemented 10 sites on top of ACS and 
wondered if I wanted to invest in his business. Uh, and, and that just doesn't happen with any of my other companies. They don't, they don't have groupies. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's just part of hooking your wagon to that community. And then I think the last thing is, uh, you know, the, from a customer perspective, while they may never actually, you know, play with the source code, I think there's a level of, uh, security and comfort knowing that if they should, should choose to, they can. Um, and, uh, and I think that, uh, is attractive to a lot of people. I think. Oh, I don't have any of those, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, 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 there we go, there we go. Um, the, uh, you know, the, this, the, this is trite, but the single biggest reason why some of our companies don't do as well as they could is, is sort of a failure of management. Um, and uh, actually, you know, my, my uh, personal worst case is uh, we ended up, making money on the investment, quote unquote, but we just missed a huge opportunity. I started with another guy, uh, a, a company that was a, a Viant, like, you know, e-business uh, consulting firm in uh, the summer of 95. So we, we were going to be an e-commerce systems integration firm before there were any. We literally started uh, uh, the company uh, two months, I think, before Viant started. And so we nailed the market opportunity. You know, if I go back and look at the business plan, we, we had the right partner ideas. We had the right, um, focus. We we're going to build big e-commerce sites for, you know, Fortune 500 and for startup organizations, uh, and recruited a, a great technical guy, um, to help start it. And then once we got it off the ground, I hired a CEO, uh, who, just didn't have the energy, the passion, the vision, the I don't know what. Um, and so I think the, certainly the, the most cases we find, uh, it's, it's the leadership lacks. They don't have a strategic direction in this particular company. We, we started out doing e-commerce, but that seemed hard. So we went to customer service and then we went to something else. And we kept flip-flopping direction back to my focus point. Uh, and we never did any of them particularly well. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's the old saying about managers, you know, a B manager recruits C people to work for he or she, whereas an A manager recruits A pluses to work for, for he or she. And, and so you just end up with an organization that's not a particularly hard charging, smart, you know, uh, passionate kind of company. So that's, that's certainly, um, a common, uh, pitfall, um, uh, certainly to the, in the extent there's, there's significant tension in management teams, you know, they just don't get along and they don't like to spend time together. Excuse me, that's always an issue. So th that's the easy one. That's sort of the big management bucket. And that probably accounts for uh, a significant portion of our companies that haven't done as well as perhaps we would have expected. Other situations where we've gotten into trouble, we've been, we've been way too early on things. Uh, you can, uh, markets can be really a lot slower to develop than you would ever expect. Uh, we started a, uh, interactive TV company in 1992, uh, with a fabulous woman from Silicon Graphics and a Hollywood producer. And, you know, 10 years later, we're still ahead of our time. Uh, and, and so that can, that can clearly be an issue. Um, and then, uh, a sort of related point is, is situations where, uh, for, for you to be successful, uh, a lot of things need to fall into place. And so we didn't invest in a company, but I looked at a company that was predicated on the success of broadband to the home. Uh, and I first saw this guy in, in 1995. Um, and while I, you know, I, I, I had a cable modem at the time and I was one of 30 customers in the state of Massachusetts that had one. And I said, gee, don't you think it's too early? And he, you know, he pulls out the analyst charts. Well, broadband to the home has taken off. It's taken off. Uh, but for it to really be in a viable business, it needed to be in 30 million homes, not 30. Uh, and so, so that can be a real, uh, a real challenge. But if you've got good people and talented, uh, technologists and, and an underlying strength, uh, in, in that area, you can often pivot. Our best example is we were investors in a company called Ascend Communications, which started out building ISDN based uh, access, internet, uh, actually it wasn't even internet at that time. This was 1989. It was, we thought ISDN was going to be huge. And they were building ISDN equipment. ISDN never took off, but it had a little niche market in video 
uh, conferencing, and so they sort of did that and rode that for a while. Uh, and then they sort of saw this thing, the Internet, happening, and they built this Internet access business um, from an equipment perspective and uh, ultimately sold the company to Lucent for $25 billion a couple of years later. So, you know, these are that was all because they were really smart people, and they just sort of, all right, that didn't work. Let's move and make that work for a while, and then let's move from there and figure out how we expand from there. The hard part as a, as a board member of a company is you never, you, 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 in my company that I described that wasn't working out all that well, the one thing the CEO did really well is he managed his board fabulously well. So, you know, things were, things were never great, but they were always just about to happen. Um, <laughs> and, and only uh, later do you then hear all the horror stories from internally. Uh, and so it's hard as a, as a board member to is be as deeply infiltrated into the company as you as you like, and you think you know a lot, but you really don't. You only know a lot if you actually work in the company day in and day out. Um, and so the first thing I think is as a as an employee in in all these companies uh, that you potentially join, you'd be you're also a shareholder. You're an option holder. Part of your responsibility, I think, is to not not be a pain in the ass, but to you know point out things that don't. That don't rub you, you know, don't, that are rubbing you the wrong way, um, and do so in a constructive manner, not just a, you know, a, a, a sort of negative uh, whining manner. Um, so I think companies that have a very open environment where people feel free to make suggestions for improvement, and and you can have an open dialogue, you know, are long term going to do uh, a lot better. Uh, and then ultimately, the way we try to uh, have an impact is in is in recruiting is you know spend a lot of time with the key managers to get a feel for you know are they going to be good managers and you know you try to be more right than wrong you can never be a hundred percent right I think what we try to tell our entrepreneurs is is one of the advantages we bring to the table I interviewed probably 250 people for a VP or CEO position last year um, so that's a pretty broad database that you try to uh, you try to bring to the table in terms of what's going to work in this particular environment uh, or, you know, referencing the person from their last job or their last two jobs to really, you know, do people like them. Um, so you can, with homework, hopefully end up with better managers rather than worse managers, um, but you're obviously never going to be 100% right. And then it's a case, you know, if someone's just not working out, you need to, you know, try to make a change and do something else. But in terms of new inflow of businesses we're seeing very few what i would characterize as the traditional you know business to consumer uh, dot com wanting to sell something i think most people have figured out that if they want to raise money for those kind of businesses it's a long road um, because the pendulum has swung you know all the way to the extreme um, we do have we have 90 companies in our portfolio and we we for the most part miss that wave um, but we have three or four that are that are finding it you know, life to be a little bit difficult. Uh, uh, there's been sort of a, uh, in addition to obviously the market for raising money to that drying up, I think the whole, the the Christmas holiday season of 99, a lot of it was driven by this was the next big wave, a lot of excitement and people were eager to try out the new things and then that pendulum swung where everyone said, oh, well, e-commerce, it's dead and it's not going anywhere and so I'm not going to bother and, and so not only if they had a hard time raising money. They've had a hard time actually driving the the revenue that they want. So we're we're certainly we, you know we and a lot of people are having their share of companies that are going through difficult times in that, um, which is too bad because there's there's actually you know not all of the ideas were brain dead. Uh, you know a lot of them are actually pretty good ideas, uh, and and some of those pretty good ideas I think will get thrown out with the bathwater. Um, but uh, I guess that's the irrationality of it all. <laughs> there's, there's there's an open-ended question. Yeah, that's right. Uh, um, we're we're uh, it goes back to a little bit of the, my point earlier, which is which is while we have some themes and ideas, ultimately it's hard to predict. You know, we're going to do this, this, and this. Um, we are you know we're we're we've made a number of investments and we'll continue to make a number of investments in the whole storage arena. Uh, storage has gone from 5% of IT spending to 55%. It's going to 85%. You know, the, the number of uh, terabytes of data is, you know, exponentially growing. And so there's huge opportunities uh, in the whole storage sector. 
we continue to invest a lot in internet security uh, just because you know ev everyone seems to think well you put a firewall around your business and you're suddenly secure and, and everything that's happening out in the world proves that that's not necessarily true and there's some, uh, some interesting opportunities there um, from an application perspective uh, or, or a, more of a systems perspective I think there's this whole movement towards the um, internet-based infrastructure and applications the whole systems management side of the equation is significantly lagged and so people are managing internet-based systems with tools and and technologies that were designed for client server based or even mainframe based uh, environments um, so we think there's some opportunities there uh, we think there's some interesting opportunities in, in distributed applications moving you know the Akamai's of the world moved content to the edge of the network uh, we think there's some opportunities to move applications to the edge of the network uh, to improve uh, performance or other characteristics um, and then uh, you know, at the end of the day, we end up, you know, again, really reacting to, to talented people who live and breathe in, in markets, you know, more than we do. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>